episode of Paradigm Profiles is about the Northern California bank robberies. On July 16, 2014, four North Annuals from Stockton, California decided that today was the day. This was the day that they were going to go back and hit Bank of the West. They had been talking about hitting this particular bank since they had hit it the first time on January 31st, 2014. But every time they got ready to do it, something came up or something wasn't right. On one prior occasion when they were casing the bank out from a Walgreens parking lot, a Stockton PD cruiser just so happened to pull into the bank's parking lot after coming out of a Del Taco drive through It was assumed that the officer was probably taking his lunch and wouldn't be leaving anytime soon. So they abandoned their plans and decided to come back another day. On another occasion, when they went back to case the bank out, they parked adjacent to the bank in a wing stop parking lot where they had a clear view at the front of the bank. This turned into another dry run due to the fact that the bank was running a routine fire drill and all the employees had evacuated the building. But when they returned a third time on July 16, 2014, everything looked right and they decided it was a go. Gilbert Renneria, Alex Martinez, Jaime Ramos, and Pablo Rubacaba executed their plan flawlessly. Renneria, Martinez, and Ramos entered the bank with handguns drawn after Pablo Rubacaba dropped them off and left in a dark Buick. Having more experience and influence, Renneria and Martinez took the lead while Ramos kind of fell back and made sure that nobody left or entered through the front doors. When they robbed the bank the first time, branch manager Kelly Huber was working her regular shift when she was approached by Martinez and was told to open the vault. Huber would later tell authorities that she was terrified and thought she was going to lose her life that day because she could tell that these guys were serious and that she didn't think that they would have hesitated to use their guns. In fact, Renneria had implemented Northaniel based policies for the crew who were well-known documented Northaniel Street Gang members. The policies included, one, anyone who slipped up and made a mental mistake of calling out any one of their names was subject to a death sentence. Two, anyone who froze up or who demonstrated an act of cowardice was either subject to a death sentence or would only receive half their cut depending on the circumstances. Three, in the event they were split up, the money was not to be counted or touched until they were all back together again. Four, if the cops showed up and attempted to stop them, everyone had to engage in a shootout and do whatever was necessary, even if this meant killing in order to get away. Nobody was going to jail. Five, if the cops did show up and tried to stop them, nobody was to fire their weapon until they all agreed that they were in the best position to do so. Jumping the gun and being a loose cannon could get everyone killed. 6. The money would be evenly split amongst the four no matter what amount. 7. They all had to agree to a pact. The pact was if anyone snitched or exposed anything about what they were doing to law enforcement, then they agreed that their mother, father, or close family members were subject to be killed. During the first robbery on January 31, 2014, Hoover did exactly what she was told. She opened the vault and filled up a black backpack that Martinez handed her. The media never disclosed the amount that they netted in this first robbery, but sources close to the investigation claimed that it was close to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 70K. After the infamous shootout that killed two of the suspects, Martinez and Renneria, and one of the hostages, Misty Holt Singh, who was used as a human shield, Police found a copy of the gang's policies that were believed to have been written by Renneria. A local gang task force sergeant said that they didn't have evidence to substantiate that Renneria was a member of either the Nuestra Familia or the Nuestra Raza, but they do believe that he may have gotten some of his indoctrination from one of Renneria's cousins who had been to prison and who was a validated gang member. Investigators unrelated to this investigation had apparently been gathering information and intelligence on both Renneria and Martinez in the years before the robbery. The two were allegedly part of a known group who were selling methamphetamine in Stockton. 
In fact, Paradigm Media News was able to find a complaint filed in November 2008 that names both Renneria and Martinez and other defendants for possession of a controlled substance for sale, possession of marijuana for sale, marijuana cultivation, and street terrorism. In the search warrant dated back in 2008, it says that Renneria was connected to a home that narcotics investigators raided in 2003 and found methamphetamine, a large amount of marijuana, and loaded firearms. The court papers also say that Renneria and his girlfriend, Angelica Tovar, the mother of his child, were arrested together for sex trafficking. Renneria was the pimp and Angelica Tovar was the prostitute. One particular day in November 2006, investigators observed Tovar get into several vehicles. A detective stopped Tovar and Renneria subsequently drove to their location, pulled a firearm and advanced on the detective. That same search warrant return states Renneria and Martinez were part of the same group known for selling crystal methamphetamine in Stockton. Investigators had been tracing their steps for a few years and linking them to various drug houses when that search warrant return was filed. I believe they along with their girlfriends Monica Lamb and Angelica Tovar are conspiring to sell or still selling illegal narcotics and cultivating marijuana within the city of Stockton. Detective Stephen Cole reported a criminal complaint filed in 2007 charges Martinez with possession of a controlled substance, ammunition charges, and failure to appear in court. A search warrant return on that case states Martinez sold narcotics to an informant with Lamb, his girlfriend, present and while under surveillance. As the three met and conversed, I watched Alex Gregory Martinez and the informant complete a hand-to-hand -hand transaction. Detective Jimmy Fritz reported, during the transaction, I could hear Alex Gregory Martinez discuss the quality of the suspected crystal methamphetamine. Court records indicate Martinez pleaded no contest to all three charges in connection to that case. Brennery and Tovar were additionally charged with child endangerment for putting their then eight-month-old child in harm's way. Martinez additionally was charged with committing a felony while released on bail or his own recognizance. Renneria pleaded guilty to two counts and received probation, while the case against Martinez was dismissed for a lack of evidence. But before that case was resolved, Renneria racked up new charges for being a felon in possession of a firearm, exhibiting a firearm in the presence of a peace officer and reckless driving. He pleaded no contest to exhibiting the firearm and the other charges were dismissed. Stockton police claim that they are confident Martinez had robbed that same bank, Bank of the West, on January 31, 2014. Investigators have reviewed surveillance footage from both incidents and spoke to witnesses who provided physical descriptions. In both robberies, someone dropped off the robbers. The men were armed, had similar disguises, and left in employee vehicles. Leaving in stolen employee vehicles was something investigators quickly took notice of as a modus operandi, method of operation. This case and the events that would follow would draw a whirlwind of criticism for the Stockton Police Department. They killed two of the bank robbers following a high speed chase that lasted for close to an hour. But they also took the life of an innocent woman who had been held hostage. Like most things in this complicated world of ours, nothing is ever simple. Every police event is fluid. However, many other extenuating factors played a critical role in this tragic event. The police department, located 60 miles east of San Francisco, was in the midst of a bankruptcy that robbed it of 100 veteran officers while leading to a reduction in training and severely limiting the ability to purchase new equipment and technology. Some of those officers were replaced with rookies straight out of the academy. The bankruptcy also meant that the department also had no air support of its own and depended upon other agencies' helicopters or fixed wing aircraft, which were not always available to the department. The Bank of the West branch that was robbed was nestled in an unusual triangular island created by three major roads with little room for containment or cover. A bus station nearby put other civilians at risk. The bank robbers led police on an hour-long pursuit, sometimes at speeds exceeding 120 miles per hour. Throughout the ordeal, 
One of the suspects fired 100 plus rounds from an AK-47 at police, disabling 14 vehicles, including their armored Bearcat. Bullets tore through cars, shattered windshields, shredded tires, and incapacitated engines. And at the conclusion, over 200 rounds were fired in the getaway vehicle. The suspects twice escaped the pursuers, but rather than attempting to disappear completely, they chose to wait and ambush police officers. Miraculously, no police personnel or civilians were injured in the shootings. One hostage was shot and wounded by a suspect and dumped from the getaway SUV while another leapt out while it was fleeing, causing her to sustain major injuries. The one surviving suspect only lived because he used Misty Holt Singh as a shield. The 41-year-old wife and mother of two, who was visiting the bank to take out money for a trip to the hairdresser, was struck 10 times by police bullets, killing her instantly. Never in the history of U.S. law enforcement has a police force dealt with such an event such as this. The only two incidents that came close was the 1997 North Hollywood shootout in which Los Angeles Police Department LAPD officers battled a pair of heavily armored bank robbers who were covered with body armor or the attempt by Brian Douglas Wells to rob a PNC bank in Pennsylvania by placing a collar bomb around his neck to make it appear as if he was the victim. Investigators would later reveal that this was possibly a ruse and that Wells was actually in on the convoluted plot. Either way, in the controversial case that aired during a live TV local news feed, the bomb around Wells' neck exploded, killing him instantly as police were waiting for a bomb squad to arrive. In the North Hollywood robbery, there were no hostages and the suspects never got mobile. On the day of the robbery, July 16, 2014, the news screamed out from dozens of Stockton police radios. Three armed men had just robbed Bank of the West. Each had come out of the bank holding a female hostage, each pointing a weapon at the woman's heads. All six climbed into a blue Ford Explorer and sped off. A bank robbery with three hostage and a mobile pursuit. Collectively, a law enforcement nightmare. Incredibly, things were about to get much worse. Over the next 62 minutes, the three bank robbers seemingly with no care for their own lives, let alone anyone they came in contact with, led their pursuers on a violent, terrifying 63-mile chase over both winding residential streets and wide open freeways, sometimes hitting 120 miles per hour, in and out of Stockton. For much of the time, one of the bank robbers sprayed 7.62 millimeter rounds from his AK-47 out the back window of the Blue Explorer, disabling 14 police vehicles, including the department's armored SWAT vehicle, but somehow never wounding a single officer or bystander. Meanwhile, another of the robbers held a handgun to the heads of two of the hostages. The third hostage was forced to drive until she was accidentally shot in the leg by one of the suspects and was tossed out in the street. When the ordeal finally ended, another hostage had suffered serious injuries after jumping out of the SUV at 50 miles per hour. And Misty Holt Singh, a 41-year-old mother of two, was dead, accidentally killed by the police who were trying to save her. In the shootout that included 600 plus rounds from more than 30 officers shot into the getaway vehicle. Police also killed two of the three bank robbers. Somehow, a third escaped without being shot, most likely because he used Holt Singh as a shield. He later found himself in jail facing murder charges. It was a tragic and unprecedented day in U.S. policing history that left many grasping for answers. Why did the suspects not give up once it became clear that their plan was doomed? Why were they instead trying to ambush the trailing officers rather than get away? How did a number of police officers who showed a remarkable restraint throughout the ordeal lose control with the startling and terrifying barrage of gunfire at the conclusion while others maintained their composure? And was there a way the hostage could have been saved? Understanding the complexities of such a horrific day means to not only perform a comprehensive and transparent look at the department's policies, but also to take a closer look at every minute during this 62-minute ordeal and to determine what could have been done different. 
Misty Holt Singh and her 12-year-old daughter, Mia, headed to the Bank of the West branch in the northern part of the city mid-afternoon on Wednesday, July 16, 2014. It was a moderately cool day for Stockton with temperatures of 82 degrees and winds of 8 to 10 miles per hour. Holt Singh, a dental assistant well known around the community for her charitable efforts, had talked to her husband Paul Singh about getting her hair done that afternoon. She parked in front of the bank's entrance and walked up to the ATM. She withdrew some money and headed toward the car where her daughter sat, immersed in her phone. At the same time, a dark four-door Buick pulled into the same parking lot. Three young men dressed in dark clothing climbed out before the vehicle drove away. Anyone who saw them could tell something was amiss. They wore hoodies over their baseball hats and carried backpacks slung over their shoulders. They wore gloves that had been duct taped to their sleeves just as they had done with the legs of their pants. Their faces were covered by obviously fake beards and mustaches and the black sunglasses shrouded their eyes. And for those looking closely, ammunition had been taped to their clothing. Holt Singh never made it back to her car. One of the three men, all members of a local street gang, intercepted her, hauling her inside the bank with his two partners who had already encountered the security officer and taken control of him. Holt Singh's daughter, Mia, sat there terrified watching as her mother was being dragged into the bank with the gun pressed against the back of her head. Kelly Huber, the branch manager, was talking to customers. This was already supposed to be an unusual day, the branch's last day before closing its doors for good. As the suspects entered the bank, Huber immediately recognized two of them from a previous robbery six months earlier. I thought to myself, oh shit, here we go again, Huber said. The suspects screamed at everyone to get on the ground. Don't be a hero, they kept saying or yelling. Don't push the button, alluding to the silent alert signal. Banks keep out of sight for employees to trigger for help. Unbeknownst to the bank robbers, a worker at the Bank of the West Corporate Security Center saw it unfold on the bank's security cameras, leading to a call to the Stockton Police Department. At the same time, a witness to the bank robbers entering the building flagged down a nearby police officer who was trying to decide what to have for lunch. She called in the report, wheeled her police vehicle around, and headed to the southwest entrance to the bank. About the same time that the gunmen entered the bank, Stockton police officials were handling what seemed like another normal day. Wednesdays are always max staffing day throughout the department as it brings two shifts together on one day. Undoubtedly, having the maximum number of staff on hand would serve the department well in the hours to come. Stockton Police Chief Eric Jones was sitting down with a reporter from the local newspaper. Both men had just attended a swearing-in ceremony for new officers who had been hired when the economy began to take a turn. The reporter was asking about staffing numbers when they heard the reports of a bank robbery. Out came a police radio. The men listened intently, and as soon as Jones heard the bank robbers had taken hostages and had taken off in a car, the interview came to an end. The reporter headed out to the scene, and Jones went to meet with the operations deputy chief for a briefing. It's indescribable what you were thinking, Jones said. We had just had a line of duty death funeral and had just given the flag to that family. I was thinking we were going to have an officer shot and killed. It's a terrible feeling. Stockton's 911 dispatch center received notification from an employee of the Bank of the West Security Center of a robbery. A dispatcher took the call, learning that the employee was watching as the robbers tied up the bank's lone security guard. Once it started going, it never stopped, the dispatcher said. I just kept on typing. Another dispatcher recalled, this thing was moving, it was changing. It was like an average day of the events all in one incident. Several police officers had been finishing canine training at the public fairgrounds. As they loaded their cars with their gear, reports of the bank robbery crackled out from their radios. The officers leapt into action. They headed directly to the police station to change into their gear and get their orders. Already, other officers were geared up, having been at headquarters for regularly scheduled meetings. There was a scramble for radios and rifles, neither of which were assigned to individual officers. Instead, they were given out on a first-come, first-served basis. 
And because of the city's bankruptcy, coupled with the large number of people working on Wednesdays, there were not enough for everyone. Throughout the city, officers already out on their respective beats heard the call. Some headed to the pursuit. In other cases, officers stayed on their beats. But for many, hearing the ordeal unfold became too much and they left behind their beats to join in on the pursuit. Back inside the bank, it felt chaotic. Everyone was lying on the ground. One of the suspects leaped over the teller's counter while the other two used plastic zip ties to bind the hands of the security guard and some of the male customers. They tried to tie the hands of an older man but stopped when he told them that he had previously broken both elbows, pointing to the scars on both arms. Another elderly woman was allowed to sit in a chair. One of the suspects, having already robbed this bank before, looked at Huber and ordered her to unlock the vault. Huber was joined by another female employee because two keys were needed to unlock it. My hands were shaking, Huber said. The suspect said, don't worry, no one is going to get hurt, just do as you're told. The suspect expressed some disappointment at the amount of money in the vault but still filled the backpack with cash and then returned to the main lobby with Huber and the other employee. They said we needed to hurry. Who has a car? We need a car. Huber recalled that after the last robbery, I had told my staff, if it ever happens again, which it won't, I will give them my car keys. Three suspects headed out of the bank. One of them gripped Huber by her shirt collar. He held a gun first to the back of her head and then to her midsection. They headed towards the SUV when they spotted an officer in the parking lot of the bank. The suspect pulled on Huber's collar and as she stepped backwards, she stumbled over a patch of landscaping and pretended to sprain her ankle. The suspect didn't believe her, yanking Huber up and slipping them both back inside. The suspects asked for a second exit and Huber lied and said the front door was the only option. Grab them, Huber recalled one of the bank robbers saying, take some girls. One of the suspects took Stephanie Kusea, a bank teller, and the other grabbed Holt Singh, who pleaded with them to leave her because her daughter was outside in the car. Unconcerned, the suspects reemerged with what were now three hostages and started moving towards Huber's SUV. Holt Singh's daughter made eye contact with her mother as she was being dragged by one of the suspects, literally a few feet away. Time seemed to slow down as they looked at each other and Mia felt like she was seeing her mom for the last time. It wasn't the circumstances that were playing out, it was just something in her mom's eyes that told her that this was their goodbye, that this was the final time she was going to see her beautiful mother alive. She wanted to help, she wanted to get out and run to her mother, but there was nothing she could do but watch. And then just as fast as she had come out, she was gone, they got into an SUV and drove off. All Mia could do at that point was weep and pray that her feelings were wrong. By this point, the first officer to arrive had retreated behind her vehicle. The authorities had a particularly difficult situation based on the layout of the property. The bank had a tiny parking lot and was part of a triangular island in the middle of three major streets, leaving little space for the officers to keep their distance while trying to apprehend the suspects. The second officer who had confronted the bank robbers the first time they had robbed the bank held a semi-automatic rifle and stood in their way, getting within a few feet of them at one point. He yelled repeatedly at them to drop their weapons, let the women go and get on the ground. A witness and the officer both recalled the women screaming frantically. Two of the suspects looked like they wanted to comply and give up, but the third, who appeared to be the leader, continued on with his cohorts in tow. I was contemplating engaging them, but that close, I knew I couldn't because if I hit one, it would go through and hit a hostage, the officer said. Moments later, he considered shooting out the SUV's tires, but chose not to because there were civilians nearby. At 2.17 p.m., the suspects made it to the car and told Huber to drive out the only exit that was not blocked by police. One suspect sat in the front passenger seat. One got in the back seat with Holt Singh and Kusea and the third climbed into the luggage area in the rear. Huber wasn't sure which way to go, how fast to drive, or whether or not to run the first red light they came upon. Things just felt out of control, and then, only five blocks from the bank, Huber heard a loud noise and felt searing pain in her right upper thigh. She thought a dye pack used by her bank had exploded. 
but all she could see was red and his dye packs were not that color. Then I heard the one in the back say, oh shit, I am sorry, I am sorry, Hoover said. The suspect had accidentally shot Hoover. She tried to drive, but her leg felt powerless. The bank robber in the front reached across Hoover, opened the driver's door, and suddenly at 2.18 p.m., she found herself lying upon the street. She had no idea what had happened. An officer pulled up nearby and told her to come to him. The pain was too much to stand, so she did three barrel rolls and found herself underneath the bumper of the cop's car. A handful of officers converged on Hoover and began treating her for not only the gunshot to the thigh, but also to her left ankle, which was injured when the bullet passed through her leg and into her ankle, shattering the bone. Shortly after, just a few blocks away, the back tended window of the Explorer exploded. The suspect in the back opened fire with an AK-47. It was the first of some 100 plus shots to come from the weapon whose sound was so recognizable to some officers that they knew exactly what they faced. At 2.20 p.m., the bullets disabled the first of many police vehicles to come. This one driven by the officer who had confronted the suspects at the bank. He had tried to zigzag while driving, but the bullets still struck three of his vehicle's four tires. The Explorer lurched forward heading north, and suddenly the chase was on. More shots fired just a few blocks away near the intersection of Thornton Road and Wagner Heights, which nearly an hour later would play a critical role in the conclusion of the chase. All the while, the frenetic movement in the Explorer kept officers from determining who was seated where. But for now, the pursuit continued. The suspect in the back kept firing, and at random moments in pursuit, some of the police officers' minds wandered in the darkness. I had just met with my life insurance guy that Saturday before, one officer said. It was a morbid thought, but I knew I was good. My family would be taken care of. Other officers text their loved ones while driving. Some did it to let them know that they were okay. Others did it for fear they might not make it home. The suspects continued to drive north, then turned east and drove some four miles before jumping on Highway 99 toward the city of Lodi, about three miles to the north. It was now 2.33 p.m. and 16 minutes had passed since the suspects fled the bank. Speeds reached 120 miles per hour and by now dozens of police vehicles had joined the pursuit. At one point during the chase, more than 50 police vehicles could be seen taking part. Altogether, the chase included marked and unmarked vehicles, motorcycles, and at one point, a Bearcat tactical vehicle. Throughout the ordeal, officers could be heard over the police radio stating their vehicles were taking rounds from the AK-47. In some case, the sounds of bullets striking the vehicles could be heard. At some points, officers sounded frantic as they relayed information about what was unfolding. At others, they sounded calm. Either way, the radio traffic made sure everyone involved understood the severity of the undertaking at hand. It's a sickening feeling hearing one of your friends and colleagues taking rounds and having no immediate ability to stop the threat, one officer said. Another added, I could hear that clack 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 of the AK. I kept waiting to hear some guy say he got hit. And then I started thinking, if this goes through my windshield, I am not going to feel it. I am just going to be gone. Equally, if not more troubling, was having to pass disabled vehicles, several officers recalled. It's a surrealistic thing, seeing cars pulled over, not knowing whether one of our brother officers has been shot, another officer said. At times, the chaos got the better of some officers who tried to get the lead. Officers passed their colleagues, sometimes at speeds exceeding 100 miles per hour, and sometimes in unmarked cars. It was crazy because all of a sudden a car came barreling up on the shoulder, passing us, and we were going more than 100 miles an hour, an officer said. And we didn't know who it is. One of us, someone else, another bad guy. So the officers kept pursuing. Obviously, there was no other choice. But it also meant there were long periods of uncertainty, leaving even the most experienced officers frustrated. This is the first time I didn't have a plan, a SWAT officer said. I didn't have an answer to make it stop. That was so difficult for me. That was something I had never experienced. In the midst of the unlawfulness passing in and out of the city, other officers converged on the bank. They knew the three suspects had left the bank, but didn't know much beyond that. 
The Explorer sped north on Highway 99 with several dozen police vehicles in pursuit. Halfway in the Lodi, the Explorer exited the freeway. At 2.32 p.m., it disappeared, heading west into the heart of the city. One of the advantages of having so many officers was some had already taken to traveling along parallel roads in preparation for just this moment. Two minutes later, officers located the Explorer about two miles to the south of surface streets. Another two minutes later, the Explorer returned to Highway 99 and headed north once again. At one point, a lieutenant driving in the chase felt there were too many vehicles involved and ordered all those behind his vehicles to back off. Most of them did, but continued to stay in the area in case the Explorer was lost again. After passing through Lodi, the Explorer exited the freeway and then jumped back on it heading south through Lodi and back towards Stockton. At 2.48 p.m., the Explorer pulled off at the Murata Lane exit. It's a short exit with a hard turn leading to a stop sign. Between the stop sign and the freeway, little can be seen because of the heavy trees and brush. It was a perfect location for an ambush. The Explorer waited patiently. One car was stopped in front of the Explorer, but also waiting nearby was Stockton Police Captain Doug Anderson. The watch commander asked him to go to the bank, which was where he was heading when the pursuit came close to him, so he searched for a place to wait and see if their haphazard driving would lead to him. Ultimately, it did just that. Anderson realized what was happening. The suspects had no intention of driving off. They were going to wait until the officers came around the corner and ambushed them. In his mind, they wanted to murder police officers. Hearing the approaching sirens, Anderson intended to shoot the driver, but then saw the gunman in the back extend his upper body out the shattered window with his AK-47 pointed toward traffic, ready to shoot. He fired off a couple rounds and saw the gunman lurch. The explorer jumped forward and suddenly was back on the run, heading west on Murata Lane. Just then, the first of the officers came around the bend, in some cases so fast that they bounded off the road as they hit the brakes. Minutes later, the chase almost came to an end. The department's Bearcat could finally come into play. The driver of the armored vehicle tried to ram the Explorer but missed by a matter of feet. The gunman fired off his AK-47 repeatedly, shredding one of the Bearcat's tires, forcing it to back off the chase as the air rushed out of his tires. The Explorer continued west before heading south and heading to the I-5 freeway. Inside the Explorer, the level of stress grew. Bullet casings were everywhere from shooting out the back window. The smell of gunpowder was overwhelming. The bank robbers found the arrival of the SWAT vehicle frightening, knowing that it carried inside officers that were trained to kill them. They were not the only ones who took notice. From the moment Kaseya, one of the hostages, had seen the SWAT vehicle, she began putting together a plan. I know jumping out of a vehicle going any speed that you can die. But when I knew with the SWAT team there, I was going to die if I didn't get out of that car, Kusea said. Her door was locked. She shifted her leg toward the door lock to see if the bank robbers were paying attention. They were not. She nonchalantly unlocked the door. 30 seconds later, it locked itself. I didn't know if they knew I had done it, she said. A little later, I thought, maybe it's because the car is moving. When I did it again, it was all in one motion. I remember my door in the handle, and that was it. Kaseya launched herself out at 3.15 p.m., cartwheeling across the street from the SUV that officers estimated was going 50 miles per hour. She blacked out, having sustained a significant head injury. Although she was badly hurt, she would survive with help from the officers who stopped to care for her as they waited for an ambulance to arrive. The Explorer continued north and then veered northwest on Wagner Heights. As they returned to Thornton Road, the street they first took when they escaped the bank, they encountered several officers on foot. The gunman in the back of the SUV opened fire. So too did the officers, two of whom were using a six foot tall electrical box as cover. They filled the Explorer's tires with bullets, causing it to fishtail down the road. Finally, the chase was near its end. As the Explorer careened to a stop less than a half mile later, the gunfire kept coming. Multiple police vehicles pulled up along the wide and open four-lane road. 
Officers fanned out. Some sought cover from their vehicles. Others found trees to use for cover. Dozens of officers fanned out, many of them opening fire. There were no dedicated shooters. There was very little control. Just police officers trying to stop a threat. The gunfire roared as more than 600 shots were fired. In some cases, officers inexplicably opened fire with their colleagues standing in front of them. One officer lay prone on the ground, searching for a target but not seeing any. At the same time, a colleague standing above him fired off shot after shot. What's your target? The prone officer yelled, thinking he was missing something. The car, responded the officer, who continued shooting. Finally, a lieutenant's voice screamed out, cease fire. There were no shots coming from the explorer. Other officers joined in, shouting out the message. For a moment, officers were unsure of what or how to approach the SUV. Suddenly, almost like a movie, the disabled Bearcat came lumbering over a ridge in the road. Tireless, it still remained a viable option. The SWAT members quickly huddled up and made plans. Using the Bearcat for protection, they walked behind it until they were close enough to approach the SUV. We knew we had to approach quickly but safely, a SWAT officer said. Our first priority, obviously, was the hostage. Some officers trained their weapons on the two motionless suspects, one in the far back and the other in the driver's seat. They opened the back doors and found Holt Singh lying on the floorboards. As they pulled her out, they found the third suspect, also lying motionless but clearly breathing. They quickly realized there was nothing they could do for Holt Singh. She had been struck 10 times. They pulled the third suspect out and to their amazement, he was unharmed most likely because he used Holt Singh's body as a shield. The suspect in the driver's seat was dead. The suspect in the far back was breathing, but he would die on the way to the hospital. Immediately, officers began some introspection of the event, particularly the conclusion. There was a lot of internal anger and frustration. We had people shooting at what? I don't know, the car? An officer said, you can't do that. You own every bullet you fire. That said, you've got officers who've been shot at for an hour and are afraid their lives are in danger, or the guy next to you's life is in danger. With the training you've had, I don't blame them. In the aftermath, police officials began following officer-involved shooting protocol. All of the 33 officers from the four separate scenes who fired their weapons were taken to a nearby What began as a rash attempt to rob a bank turned into a day of tragedy and pain for three families who unwillingly found themselves in the midst of the crime. No one lost more than Misty Singh Holt and her family. Holt Singh was killed by police bullets fired to try to stop a trio of bank robbers from a shooting rampage that turned the streets of Stockton and the freeways around it into a war zone. Paul Singh made it very clear that he is not happy with the way his wife Misty died or the actions by the Stockton Police Department. His lawyer filed an intent to sue Stockton for the decisions and actions made by the police officer. Also filing intents to sue are the two hostages, Kelly Hoover, the Bank of the West branch manager, and Stephanie Kusea, a bank teller. Both sustained serious injuries. Jaime Ramos, 22, the only suspect that miraculously survived inside the deadly shootout from inside the Explorer, was subsequently charged with two counts of homicide for the deaths of his co-defendants and a third count of homicide for the death of hostage Misty Holt Singh. Under the Felony Murder Act, fellow co-defendants can be charged with their co-defendants murder if they died in the commission of committing a felony. It doesn't matter how they died. If you were a part of the felony that was being committed, you bear responsibility for their deaths. Ramos was also charged with multiple counts of attempted murder for all the officers who were shot at. All told, he faced over 30 charges and was eligible for the death penalty. A fourth suspect, Pablo Rubacaba, 23, who was later identified as the driver that dropped off the three bank robbers, was also charged with Misty Holt Singh's murder under the Felony Murder Act. In late 2016, both defendants pleaded guilty to avoid a possible death sentence. Ramos was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Ruvacalva was sentenced to 25 years to life, officially putting an end to a tragic case that still continues to haunt the Singh family 
and all the other victims who were involved. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. We should be dropping another episode this week, but until then, as always, we want to thank all those of you who continue to support the channel.